In this lecture for computing systems, we're going to introduce and look at a range of different multimedia. So first of all, we're going to consider some graphics. So the image we have here, for example, is a bitmap image. And I've marked out a small area in red. Zoom in on that area, we can see that the image is made up of individual pixels, picture elements. Each pixel is a small square of a single color. When we look at it from a distance, we can't quite see the difference between individual pixels because they're very small, and so we can see the overall image. So if I go back, we can see that within that area we can see the letters PC, area that's marked out, and we can see those letters here in the enlarged image. And we can enlarge that even further and zoom right in on individual pixels. A bitmap image has rows and columns of pixels, and each pixel is a distinct colour. It's worth mentioning at this point the different colour systems that we have. We have additive and subtractive colours. When we're using computer graphics, we're generally using additive colours. So if we add red, add green and blue together and add them all together, we get white. So this is mixing light. So when we add red light and green light and blue light, we get white. If you're used to working with paint, for example, you might be surprised at this, or you might expect the opposite to occur. Indeed, when we're working with subtractive colours, as in with paints or with dye, if we add yellow and magenta and cyan, we start to get a darker and darker shade until eventually we can get some black or something that's near black. So the more colours we mix with subtractive colouring, with paints or with inks, we get a darker result. But with working with light, as we add different colours together, then we get a whiter or lighter result. So computer graphics often use RGB, red, green, blue, where black is zero red plus zero green plus zero blue. And white will be the maximum value of each of the three components. We can get red by having the maximum red and zero blue and zero green. And by mixing different amounts of red, green and blue, we can get other shades and other colours. So for example, this particular shade of pink is the result of 255, the maximum value of red, plus about half, a little bit over half green and quite a high value of blue as well. And that gives us that shade of pink. CMYK is a colour system widely used in printing, which stands for cyan, magenta, yellow and key. And the key is usually basically black. So a black ink is used because it's hard to get a pure black by mixing the different colours of ink. So we have a black ink as well as the cyan, magenta and yellow. We can approximate the different colours that we get by using an RGB system and by mapping between the colours so that Hopefully what you get when you print out a screen from your computer, you hopefully get the same result, although the inks that are getting mixed work differently from how the colour system works when it's being used on your monitor on the screen. High quality printing systems often use six ink colours, so they may use extra ink colours just to be able to allow better mixtures of ink. So the bitmap graphics are also known as raster graphics. So the raster, it's an unusual word, but the raster is a rectangular pattern of colours. So it's, we've got scan lines, and as we go along each line, there's a series of pixels across each line. So rows and columns of pixels that make a complete image. And most modern displays are using either LCD or plasma display technologies. There's a wide range of different technologies, resolutions and screen sizes available. Some of the common screen sizes are seen here, and... For comparison, we can kind of see the shape and aspect ratio of them. So HD television is quite widely supported now by computers because a lot of people will view the output there from their computer on television. And an HD television at 1080p has a screen resolution of 1920 by 1080 pixels. The nearest computer monitor screen resolution close to that is WHGA. Widescreen Ultra Extended Graphics Array, which is 1920 by 1200. And we can see a range of other 
basically older screen sizes, so going back to 1987, state of the art then might have been for VGA graphics, which were 640 by 480 pixels. Obviously much less resolution than is it capable today with today's graphics cards and today's display technology. Worth considering how much display RAM is required for, for example, WXGA. Well, for the image, we often work with 24 bits for each pixel. So each pixel has 8 bits for red, 8 bits for green, 8 bits for blue. So that gives us 24 bits. So we have 3 bytes times 1920 times 1200, which gives us approximately 6.6 .6 megabytes. Current graphics cards today typically have anywhere from half of a gigabyte to two gigabytes of dedicated graphics memory. They have to store much more than just the screen buffer. They actually have to store a lot of extra detail required for generating the screen image, which is why we have much larger screen buffers. And particularly if you're using 3D games, there's a lot of other texture and image data that is used in creating the final image that goes to screen. If you're saving an image, a bitmap image, as a file, there's a range of different formats that you can use. And here's some of the common ones. BMP is widely used in, in Windows machines, usually uncompressed, so you get really large file sizes. So if you took your screenshot and saved it as a file, you could have a single file that would be something like 6 megabytes of file size. JPEG or GIF or PNG or other quite common formats. GIF is less common now, it used to be very widely used, but because it had patent, it had patented compression algorithms, people began to adopt other algorithms and other formats that were not encumbered by patents that had to be licensed. And PNG became very popular for use in the web as a result. And most other formats that are popularly or widely used have some form of compression. So compression allows you to have smaller file sizes for the same size of image because you're having some kind of coding system that takes the data and represents it with a smaller number of bytes. JPEG, for example, uses a lossy compression, so it throws away some of the data and you get a reduction in image quality. But what it tries to do is make sure that the reduction in image quality is not going to be visible, but it's going to allow it to have much smaller file sizes. PNG uses a lossless compression. As well as bitmap graphics, there are also vector graphics widely used in computing systems. And whereas a bitmap image has actual pixel values, and so when you zoom in, you get this pixelation, vector graphics, instead they store data about the shape. So they store data about, for example, the shape of this line the positions of the start and end of this line, and then it can draw a straight line. And as you scale it up, it's always going to be a straight line. And for the curves, it will store a set of parameters that describe the curve. So as you zoom the image up, the curve is always going to be perfectly maintained. And so SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, don't store the pixels for outputting directly. What they store are instructions on how to draw the image. So that however you scale the image, it can always be drawn pixel perfect. SVG is a very popular format supported by most modern web browsers. It's used in Flash and it uses XML, extensible markup language, as a way of defining the actual image. And so here's a little bit of example code for defining an, an SVG image. As you can see, there are instructions for drawing particular lines and particular shapes. That's how computers, very briefly, how computers can output images to screen. How do computers get images in? Well, we can consider just now digital imaging. And what's quite nice here is we have an image here of a digital camera that's been disassembled, but is actually still working. So this is a live digital camera, even though the casing has been removed. So we can see some of the different components and parts that are there. So the image is very blurry because this is a sensor device here, but the lens has been taken off, so it's no longer in focus. So it's a very blurry image now. But here's the lens, the imaging device here, circuitry here, and here we've got a screen. If 
there are two main types of imaging sensor charge coupled devices and CMOS sensors they have broadly comparable performance you can read more on this online and in the textbook and it doesn't seem that there's a particular favorite or a particular trend towards one technology over the other the actual sensor on its surface will actually have different pixels that detect different colors red green and blue and they actually detect them in an unusual pattern this rgb data is saved into different pixels and software interpolation is used to then create the final image so there's a software algorithm that runs as well as the actual hardware sensors so on the imaging device there will be a surface area which will be split up into individual pixels and each pixel has got its own image sensor for it so each individual pixel is picking up some part of the image that's then going to be produced when it comes to audio and digital audio in particular there are some things that are certainly worth knowing so audio itself uses sound waves that vary in amplitude and frequency and human hearing covers a particular range of frequencies typically from around 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz and the frequencies which we can hear and there are obviously other sounds that we can't hear that perhaps, for example famously dogs can hear some sounds that we can't and so there are basically waveforms at different amplitudes different sizes and different frequencies and we perceive these as sound but these are all continuous waves like this blue wave here this blue wave pattern it's a very continuous pattern but a digital audio system has to use discrete values we can't have this continuous range it's got to be a, a set value for a set period of time so we actually have an audio frequency that we can sample at which is a long time here how wide these boxes are give us the limit of the maximum frequencies that we can capture and the height really giving us the amplitude information about the different sounds that we can capture and we have an input sound wave in blue and that has to get turned into digital audio it gets quantized and the digital audio is shown here in red and we can see here that the red waveform isn't a true representation of the original audio it's an approximation to the true sound and there are various rules and ways in which the approximation, the digital uh, version of the sound can be kept close enough so that people, human listeners, can't hear the difference. And that's the key thing is that we have to try and make sure that people listening can't hear the difference. It's okay if it's not exactly the same, but what we want to try and do is minimise audible differences. One of the ways we do this is we have a sampling rate that's a little bit over twice the maximum frequency that people can hear so a common audio frequency for music for example is 44 kilohertz whereas people can only hear up to 20 kilohertz and that minimizes sampling errors and audible sampling errors like graphics there's a wide range of audio formats WAV is one that Windows use for, uses for example for as part of the inbuilt sound recorder and it's an uncompressed sound file sound files can be really very huge in size so WAV files are not at all suitable for music they're okay for short sound effects for example but not very good for music because you get huge files mp3 is a very widely used file format it supports different bit rates so you can decide to use a lower bit rate which will give you a lower quality version of the audio file but will also give you a lower file size we have AAC which was designed as a successor to mp3 and is a standard format on for example iTunes and iPod these formats mp3 and AAC both have lots of patents around their use which means if you're building a system that's an mp3 player you have to license the mp3 codex similarly for the AAC Vorbis is an open source patent free compressed audio format so it's comparable to mp3 and AAC but without any patents so anyone can use it for free the software itself isn't necessarily free for commercial use but 
the the codec is free so anyone can write their own software to do it and they don't have to pay a licensing fee for using Vorbis. Going from still images and audio, why don't combine the two together and we can come up with video. So most video capture we usually work anywhere from 24 up to 60 frames per second. So modern televisions for example often work at 60 frames per second. And simply a succession of still images that appear to the observer as smooth motion and you can do this for yourself for example if you have a notepad and you draw doodles in the corners of the pages and then you turn it into a little flip book a succession of still images appear to be a single moving image sometimes you can, can get odd effects it's a famous wagon wheel effect you get on television with bicycle wheels or wagon wheels when you're turning at a certain speed the frame rate that the image the film is going at coupled with the speed the wheel is actually travelling at is almost like a strobe effect and makes the wheel appear to be turning in reverse that's a kind of a, as a result of kind of strobing and then you can kind of ask well if we say we've got a video stream and each still image within that stream takes about 256k we're filming at 24 frames per second what's the final size for a 90 minute film and basically it's huge it's over 8000 gigabytes so we have this massive requirement for film storage if we've got this way of storing videos as it happens videos work in much smaller amounts of memory because they use keyframes and they use different compression techniques as well if we're just compressing the data for each frame individually it will still be very large file sizes. How video compression works is they tend to use keyframes. You recognise that in many scenes, <clears throat> the amount of change from one frame to the next frame is quite small. So often we have, for example, a still camera and a figure moving, which means that most of the scene isn't changed at all. There's one area within the scene that's changing. So the idea with a keyframe is to store the difference between each frame instead of having to store the whole image we only store the data that says this bit is different and every so often we have a new keyframe so whenever the scene changes or at regular intervals <coughs> we can present a new keyframe when it comes to video file formats there's an important distinction between containers and codecs different container formats can store different related streams of data in one file so the video data and audio data is normally stored as separate streams of data you can also have captions, so the text captions to go with a film as another stream of data, and any metadata, descriptive data about the film, for example. What a codec is, is a software algorithm for compressing and decompressing audio or video data. So some container formats have a fixed or standard codec. Some container formats allow the use of a wide range of codecs. For example, AVI is a standard Windows video format, but it doesn't actually specify what codec is going to be used. There is a very, very large range of codecs that AVI can work with. And you can certainly be in a situation where you're trying to play an AVI film on, a, on your computer. You've taken it from one computer and it worked fine. You copy it over to your own computer and discover it doesn't play because the correct codec has not been installed. So the codec is a separate thing from the container. So all videos stored in an AVF file will have been compressed using a particular codec, but being able to play it back on another computer relies on that other computer having the same codec installed, which is not always the case. WMV is another Microsoft format with optional digital rights management. It's available for Blu-ray support as well, and again I think supports a range of codecs. MP4 is MPEG4 based on Apple's QuickTime. It's also known as uses the H264 codec. The H264 codec is favoured by Apple and Microsoft, one of the situations where the two companies work together quite well, and is available in Blu-ray as well. And Apple and Microsoft want H264 to be the standard for web video going forward. The alternative video format for web, web video is something called WebM, which is sponsored by Google. It's license-free, 
uh, uses VP8 video codec and the Vorbis audio codec. And there is a currently ongoing patent dispute between WebM and the MPEG Moving Pictures Expert Group, who are the comp group that license MP4. So there is an actual patent dispute in courts just now. Where we sometimes end up watching video is when we're trying streaming or watching video over the internet. So just briefly a little bit about this. <clears throat> there are two key systems that computers, servers can use to send data out to clients. So I'm sitting at home watching a video on YouTube. I'm a client. Lots of other people might be watching YouTube at the same time. Chances are that each person watching YouTube is watching typically are going to be watching a different video or if they're watching the same video they probably didn't start watching it at the same time as me. So what YouTube will be doing will be using Unicast sends a different video stream to each client. Sometimes however for live events lots of people want to uh, log in and watch the same event live for example on the BBC and so they'll have a server that's trying to send the same data to lots of clients. And so this will typically use some multicast technology. An idea here is that they send out one video stream, but it goes to lots of different receivers. The advantage for multicast is that it means that they don't have to send out as much data as if they had to send a separate version to every viewer. But every viewer is limited by the same input stream. It also requires some specialist hardware at the server end to support this. So for media hardware, our audio signals are continue, these continuous analog waves and there will be specialist hardware for performing this conversion from the analog continuous sound wave coming in and turning it into a digital signal. And when it comes to playing it back, we have the opposite. We have a digital to analog conversion. And digital audio devices will ha have built into them ADC and DAC circuits built into the device. And they can actually all be built into, into single chips now. So an MP3 player will often have all of the circuitry built into a single chip. Audio and video involve processing large quantities of data. So special digital signal processors are often used so that the CPU doesn't have to do this. So the idea here is for all the compression and decompression that's going on, if we can farm out some of that to specialist circuits and specialist chips so the CPU can carry on doing the things a computer or smartphone CPU is uh, more often used for. And the digital signal processors or chips that are going to be designed specifically for high performance on typical media algorithms. Now some CPUs do have designs built into them so that they can do DSP processes they can do digital signal processing and they can do it more efficiently than purely generic processors can. So you do sometimes get some elements of DSP signal circuitry built into CPUs. And sometimes it will be an entirely separate device so that the CPU doesn't have to be involved at all. And as usual, lots lots more reading. Uh, so within the book, reading's already been indicated. Uh, Principles of Computers Hardware has a little bit on displays, but not much else on this. Wikipedia, as usual, has got information on all of these topics. Bitmaps and colour spaces, scalable vector graphics, file formats, digital audio, video compression, codecs, etc, etc. So plenty more to read there. And, and as usual, the image credits 